Dobrý den. Bohužel um, mluvím jenom uh, něco český, so I think I'll just continue in uh, English. <laughs> so, uh, what I would like to talk to you about today, and it's a pleasure for me to be here at uh, ML Prague. I love Prague a lot, and I travel to Prague from, from Nuremberg often. I would like to talk to you uh, about our the most efficient supercomputer. Um, before I go into the details of this uh, AI supercomputer, I would like to address a, um, a, a topic which we have noticed at uh, NVIDIA, and that topic is actually related to what are we doing in HPC, and what is deep learning doing in terms of transforming HPC and the supercomputing world. Uh, what we have actually noticed is that uh, we are seeing a convergence of traditional HPC, which is addressing mainly the uh, scientific computing uh, aspect of supercomputing, and deep learning. So, uh, we see a lot of scientists who have been doing uh, scientific computation up to now adapting deep learning techniques to improve their uh, algorithms. And I've just, uh, just to show a few examples of uh, where it's been used, for example. Uh, the uh, first example is uh, uh, an example of um, uh, satellite image uh, analysis. So what they do here is they use deep learning to actually automatically analyze satellite images in terms of um, and, um, pre predicting and, uh, and uh, analyzing the aspects of, of the uh, transfer images. Uh, the other thing is, and now, now we're in the predictive world, weather forecasting. Predicting um, weather forecasts is uh, something where uh, deep learning is being used also. And uh, everyone asked about how deep learning will be uh, affecting their work, their future work. Uh, everyone asked, said, um, we see that uh, deep learning and AI will actually uh, positively impact what we are doing in the future. So, what does that mean? Actually, that means that the uh, supercomputer of the future will have to be able um, to compute various different workloads. The uh, scientific workloads as up to now, plus the uh, deep learning workloads. So, the supercomputer of the future will have to be able to handle various different file formats, various different uh, data formats. Uh, if you're looking at scientific computing uh, with uh, high precision, you're probably talking about uh, um, um, double precision performance, FP64 performance, single precision, FP32 performance. Um, but if you're, if you're going more and more into deep learning, uh, performance doesn't matter that much. Uh, you would uh, um, like to sacrifice performance, sacrifice the uh, precision uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of being able to handle larger neural networks. So then you're talking about FT16 or even means 8. So uh, the accelerator or the um, supercomputer of the future will have to handle all data types, all data types on a well-balanced level. Now, before I get into uh, the supercomputer, uh, the first question I would like to ask, of course, and I'm going to answer that myself, so don't worry. Um, what do NVIDIA and Apollo 11 have in common? So, let's start with Apollo 11. What was Apollo 11? I, I remember I was nine years old at that time. Uh, lived in, uh, in uh, Canada, in Montreal. We got up at midnight and I watched a fuzzy black and white picture of Neil Armstrong stepping onto the moon. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, had the same experience. I don't think I've done too many. But uh, I remember that a long, a long time ago, 47 years ago. Okay, I have to, I have to also that it's 48 years now. Uh, it's a small step for mankind, or a giant leap for man, uh, uh, for mankind. Um, Saturn V was the booster, was the booster of Apollo 11. So we we'll just keep that in the back of our head. Saturn V is a booster. So what's the next moonshot? Uh, there was a cancer moonshot which, which was uh, initiated last year by the uh, former U.S. President uh, Barack Obama. And the cancer moonshot is an, an initiative uh, which should booster the uh, cancer research, the global cancer research. So 
What this cancer moonshot is intended to do is advance cancer research by the same way Apollo 11 took us to the moon. That is what this initiative is intended to do. And actually, we are helping to do that. And that's why our AI supercomputer is actually dubbed Saturn V. Saturn V is the booster to the cancer moonshot. And that's what Apollo 11 and NVIDIA have in common, let's say. So we now see that deep learning is, ha is having a huge impact on um, the HPC and the supercomputing world. I've already mentioned these um, examples. Now let's see what is Saturn V. This is actually Saturn V. Saturn V, our supercomputer, is uh, our giant leap toward exascale computing. So exascale computing, a uh, supercomputer capable of one exaflop of compute performance. This is our first leap, or our giant leap, towards this uh, global goal. We uh, installed this uh, computer at our own premises, so it's we installed and operated by NVIDIA. Uh, it's our own. We didn't sell it. We would like to, but we didn't. Um, it was installed at the uh, end of last year, within one month, and it reached uh, rank 28 on the top 500 list of the world's fastest supercomputer. So it is rank 28. I'll, I'll get into a few details later on. But what is even more important is uh, we actually, off, off the shelf, reached rank one in the green 500 list. So this uh, AI supercomputer is the most efficient supercomputer in the world. And what are we talking about? Actually, this is the uh, performance, which we saw uh, um, running the uh, Linpack HPL uh, benchmark. Uh, we were achieving almost five uh, petaflops of uh, double precision peak performance. It's uh, four times that number in FP16, which is quite relevant for deep learning. So it's almost 20, 20 petaflops of, uh, of deep learning performance at your fingertips. And if you take a look at the um, current top 500 list, you'll actually notice that you only need 13 DJX1, which is this label building block here. You only need 13 DJX1 to actually get into the current top 500 list. Uh, in terms of um, um, energy efficiency, we reached an efficiency of 9.46 gigaflop per watt, which is a 42% increase versus the, uh, the older Green 500 list six months ago. So we're actually doing giant leaps in energy efficiency, and with the upcoming Volta architecture, we're probably even going to double that. Uh, we're still far away from actually being able to implement an exaflop scale supercomputer. Because if you, if you take 9, 9.46, or let's make it simple, 10, 10 gigaflop per watt, one exaflop would mean you would need about 105 megawatt of power, which is quite a lot. So that's, I think that the uh, power consumption of a smaller city. I don't know what, what, what Prot needs, but uh, <laughs> it would be something around that or even higher. Um, what we predict would be capable to do is an installation uh, around about 20 to 30 megawatt. 20 to 30 megawatt is something which would be possible. So we have to work on our efficiency, and we're quite quite confident that with two or maximum three generations of, of, of our GPUs, we'll be able to reach that sweet spot where we will be able to actually implement an exaflop computer. <coughs> so, what, what does this um, Saturn V super, uh, AI, uh, super computer consist of? It's actually 125 nodes. Each of them is this DJX1 label building block. Uh, each of these DJX1 has eight Pascal P100 GPUs in it. And this is the heart of the system. So this is the most complex chip in the world, 15.8 billion transistor functions in one, one giant chip. So it's uh, 1,000 GPUs in total. Each of them has about 3,500 CUDA cores. So it's 
three and a half million CUDA cores you can use within this constraint. The energy efficiency, we already talked about it, 9.5 gigaflop per watt. And uh, the total consumption was around about 350 kilowatts for the total cluster. The nodes, so if, if, if you're um, using your calculations within the node, no problem. We are very high performance and e-link between all uh, P100 Pascal chips, so we, we're, we, we don't have any limitations like PCI Express or things like that, and the link is much more, uh, uh, much, much higher performance. Um, but if you want to expand using uh, several nodes, you have to interlink them, of course. What we use for doing that is a uh, high performance infinity band, so we're using the latest technology, EDR infinity band, with uh, 100 gigabit per second uh, uh, transfer bandwidth. And it's all linked up in a partial factory topology. This is what we uh, uh, saw using the um, standard HHPL uh, benchmark when we submitted to the top 500 in the Green 500 list. What you actually see here is um, during the computational time how the, um, uh, the power consumption uh, varies. Uh, at, at, at the beginning, of course, you'll be at, at the highest end and collecting all the data, etc. The power goes down, but um, actually uh, uh, the average power is, is, is what, what is, is, is then used for comparison. So if we take a look at the uh, Green 500, okay, the Green 500 list, we're definitely on rank one, with uh, a huge leap uh, in, uh, to uh, rank number two. But rank number two, by the way, also uses P100, and it's uh, the Swiss National Supercomputing Center, CSCS, which is the largest uh, GPU-based installation we have in Europe. Um, but if you take a look at the top 500 list, and I think that's uh, um, very, very, very interesting to see is uh, we're on rank 28 and we're using 350 kilowatts. If you take a look at the adjacent ranks, take a look at what they're using. So they're a factor three, four, five, uh, even more higher than our power consumption. So we're actually on, on, on the right way towards exascale computing. This is actually what um, our EGX1 looks like. So we have a mezzanine board which um, takes up these uh, eight P100 modules, these SXM modules I just showed here. So this is actually the heart of the system again. And uh, we have a host system um, consisting of a, uh, two uh, server GP, uh, CPUs and a local um, seven terabyte um, SSD cache system. And was one of the most important things too is the uh, interconnection. So we have a uh, quad IP. So we have four infinity band ports with uh, 100 gigabit per second each, and standard dual 10 gigabit Ethernet, of course. This is again the heart of the system. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on that. Time is running. <laughs> you can ask me. I'm going to be around here today. This is how it's interlinked. So we have the individual nodes up here. They're all uh, interconnected by a, uh, each of them has four four uh, EDR infinity band ports interconnected with the partial factory topology, and uh, that's how we uh, use this, uh, use the system. Uh, interesting is um, the software portion of it. So what we actually implemented here is a um, lightweight uh, uh, virtualization. So the underlying system, the host OS, in this case it's a standard Ubuntu Linux we're using. Um, but we have a, um, a um, Docker. Uh, it's, it's, it's based on, on the Docker project, but it's a modified one. It's called NB Docker because we have to virtualize the uh, GPU resources. So it's NB Docker and on top of the NB Docker we offer the containers you need. So you actually, with the BGX1, you don't have to install a single piece of software. You take it out of the box, you uh, apply power to it, you, uh, you uh, hook up your internet, you hook up your network, and it's up and running. Uh, you just have to interface with, with our enterprise service portal, you download the available containers, and you get them up and running. So for, for all leading frameworks, and we uh, uh, saw in the, in, in the former presentation, 
web building frameworks with TensorFlow. Uh, we have a TensorFlow um, <laughs> container also. So you can take that container, get it up and running, and you don't install anything. And you know that it's, it runs perfectly right out of the box because we're responsible for, for that. So what we do is we, we optimize the containers. We guarantee that the containers have the total environment needed uh, to get it up and running perfectly. Let's get back to the uh, cancer research. Short overview on what are we actually doing there. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, research institutes are accelerating their discovery on how to uh, develop new cancer therapies. How are we going to fight cancer? When we find relevant therapies of fighting cancer, then of course the next step is uh, adapting these therapies to individual patients. So individualized um, drugs and individualized therapies is something which we will see more and more in the future. It's not going to only be a standard drug you, everyone will be taking. The drug which you will be um, using will be adapted exactly to your individual person. And so what we have to do is we have to predict and we have to simulate how that drug will work on every individual person. And as soon as we've discovered that, the next logical step is taking that into a productive use, automatically using it in hospitals so that you have the best possible treatment. But we're using our own supercomputer for other uses also. Uh, one interesting use and, uh, is this one. We are actually using deep learning to aid us in developing our upcoming GPU architectures. So our GPUs are, will be designing the GPUs of the future. And anyone here Skynet or Terminator now? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, well, let's, uh, we're actually using deep learning to uh, be able to predict how will a new architecture perform, or what is uh, bad versus good architecture details. And our supercomputer is helping us to uh, get those next possible best GPUs to on the road. Of course, we're also using it for autonomous driving, one of the driving forces of uh, deep learning at the moment. So the whole automotive industry is into this. Uh, we actually have a um, proof of concept called BB-8. This is BB-8, our own um, our autonomous driving vehicle. And um, we're using Saturn V to train that vehicle too. And of course, we're doing standard underlying um, research and development in uh, basic deep learning. So let's get back to what we actually support. Uh, these are the, um, some of the leading applications in the scientific computing world. We support directly out of the box, so there is a GPU accelerated version available. And we have a catalog of supported applications which contains more than 435 applications at the moment. Then of course we're using all relevant frameworks which are available at the moment. So any framework you're using, you'll find it here. And of course, we have a lot of resources you can also use in, in, the, in the cloud, and they are also available in a GPU accelerated version. So, we also have leading collaborations with the research departments here. Uh, and I'm just um, talking about the ones here in Europe I'm responsible for. And these are these three ITSIA in uh, Lugano in Switzerland headed by Jürgen Spittruber, who is the um, director of that institute. And um, one of the students of Jürgen Spittruber is Seth Hochheiter, who developed LSTMs, for example. His, his, his doctorate paper was on LSTMs. Uh, then we're supporting DFKI. DFKI is the German um, research center for artificial intelligence, uh, located in uh, Kaiserslautern and three other locations. Uh, they have more than 800 researchers in Germany working on artificial intelligence and applications. And what they actually concentrate on is um, getting research results into practical use. So transferring the research results done by the universities and the research institutions and getting that into real world applications and real world products. They do nothing else. They concentrate on that. 
And then the uh, largest initiative in Germany at the moment is the so-called Cyber Valley Initiative, which is a Silicon Valley-like incubator for deep learning. It's being funded by, the, um, by Germany and also the federal state of Baden-Württemberg, and it's spearheaded by the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, uh, which is uh, the uh, leader of this pack. And at the end, the only thing I would like to do, uh, would like to mention is that uh, if you're now interested in the deep learning and you want to dwell more into it, uh, regardless if you're a beginner, an advanced, or an expert, uh, we've initiated something called uh, DLI, our Deep Learning Institute. And within this DLI, uh, here's a link to it, um, you can then download and use workshops, uh, self-paced labs, you can have access to case studies, you can interact with our technicians via technical blogs or whatever. Uh, we can do on-site workshops, which, which we do in a customer-based um, version. Uh, these are all the possibilities we have of aiding you to get to the next steps within deep learning. And with that, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation and happy to ask any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? I have one question. Uh, can you share uh, details of how you use your supercomputer to design new versions of a super supercomputer? Okay. Um, we actually use it in two versions. Well, version number one is, of course, um, uh, our, our um, manufacturing process. Uh, we do not uh, manufacture the chips ourselves, so that is outsourced to uh, like um, TSMC or Samsung who are actually do the, do the uh, production of, of the chips based on 16 nanometer fit fit technology. Um, what we actually do is we want to optimize those processes, of course, and we feed that back with processing data into the deep learning system, and we are able to uh, optimize the processes to have a higher bit. That, that, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, we have a long history of GPUs. So we've been designing GPUs for a long time. We've done good designs, we've done not so well designs, and we've done bad designs, which didn't reach the market. Uh, <laughs> but they're somewhere in, 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 a, in a file or a desk somewhere. Uh, we feed the uh, neural nets with the, all of these designs, and all of the small, smaller sub-designs also. And that net will then be able to uh, predict what is a good, good design and what is a bad design. And that will help and aid the uh, designer of our chips to uh, get to the um, best possible solution in the shortest time. That's, that's how we use it at the moment. Okay, thank you. More questions? We know, we know that GPUs are designed for, for processing images. So it, the fact that, that it's good for, for deep learning is, is kind of accident. So that, and there, I know that there are companies who are, who, are, who are designing their own chips customized for deep learning, like Google's TPU. How do you compare these? Okay. Um, well, first, first of all, we have to find, uh, we have to differentiate between training phase and in, in inference phase. So TPUs, for example, are, are great for inference, productively applying the, the trained networks. But prior to that, you have to train them, and that's where you need the horsepower. Um, that's, that, that's where you need these chips. Uh, that, that's where you need not only one of these chips, but many of them. Uh, and uh, uh, interconnected in, in the fastest possible way, which we do using NVMe. Um, of, of course, our, we always, when we design the GPU, we always do a trade-off. We have to satisfy the demands of many, uh, many customers. We have to satisfy the demands of, 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 of the players. They want to have their the fastest first-person shooters with the amazing video uh, experience, etc. But they're not interested in, in double precision or in eight performance or whatever. So they have their standard FP16 performance. 
On the other side, we have to satisfy the demands of our professional users, so the um, Quad Pro users, the 3D AutoCAD users who are using them, and they're not interested in highest performance and visual uh, aspects. They want to have safety, reliability, stability, because if the engineer is not able to, uh, to work for a full day, that's going to cost the company a substantial amount of money. So those demands are different. Then we have our high performance users who are interested in FP64, double precision performance and other things. Uh, so we have varying demands. But the, uh, so we will always have to do a compromise because we have a single architectural design which has to meet all these different demands. Uh, so it is a trade-off. Specialized hardware will, Ill, will uh, always be better than a generalized hardware fitting all of those demands. But, but, and now that's the point I'm coming to. Uh, because we're using a single architecture, we will be able to reduce this in millions of numbers. That will keep the costs down. We will have a unified driver aspect, so we'll only have a single software development, and so our invest in each, in each additional architecture will be limited. We would have a much higher invest if we would have had to have highly optimized hardware for each demand. But that will keep the pace up. Every one and a half years, we're going to introduce a new architecture, which will be double the power again, or double the efficiency, or whatever. So we're going to keep that pace up. Maybe at some time, in, in, in uh, those specialized hardware will be better than ours, but we're going to pass them. It's only a matter of time. But despite all of that, your, your hardware is still, is still so expensive. <laughs> talk, talk, talk to me, maybe, yeah. maybe, when, when, maybe yeah. we can do something on that. <laughs> when are you guys going to bring the price down so that every nerd on this planet can have a supercomputer? <laughs> We're working on that. <laughs> do we have more questions? No? Then thank you very much. Thank you.